Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. I love that story, how the Grinch stole Christmas. Who's with me, huh? All right, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. So I want to share just a little bit from the beginning of that story. I'll read to you from Dr. Seuss himself. It says, every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask me why. I don't really know the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all, and the kids got this, his heart may have been two sizes too small. You know, what's interesting about the the Grinch is despite his just hatred for Christmas, even though he had a, a tiny heart, he was able to recognize that there's something more to Christmas. And if you've ever watched the movie or, or you've read the story, uh, you know that he tries to steal Christmas, right? right? He, he goes down into Whoville and he steals all the presents and he, he, he steals all the decorations and he even took the last can of Hoo Hash. Can you believe that? And he gets them all into his makeshift sleigh and poor Max takes it all the way up to the top of the mountain. And just as he's about to push this sleigh over the cliff and off into oblivion, he hears something. He hears singing. And you can imagine the Grinch's surprise, right? Because he had stolen Christmas. He had taken everything. And so he might have expected to hear crying. He, he might have expected to hear grumbling and complaining, but instead, he hears the very last thing he expected, singing. And the story goes on to say, every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming, it came. Somehow or another, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet all cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, is a little bit more. See, the Grinch made this profound realization about Christmas, that, that it's not just about receiving gifts. In fact, as fun as it is, it's not just about giving gifts. It's something so much more. And we as a church have spent the last several weeks talking about some of the who questions of Christmas. And today we continue that theme with who is Jesus? Appropriate, right? I think Jesus is a name that nearly everyone in our culture recognizes. It's a name we're all familiar with. But I wonder, do we all really know who Jesus is? It's interesting to me how in this season so often we get Jesus confused with old Saint Nick. Jesus is loving. Jesus is kind. Jesus will help you when you're in a bind. He'll give you great gifts and reward good behavior, but not so much if you're naughtier than your neighbor. This is the version of Jesus that, that many of us seem to know. But is that really who Jesus is? As we look at the Christmas story, we get insight into who Jesus really is. And we read in Luke chapter 2, if, you're, uh, if you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along, go to Luke chapter 2. We see this young couple, Joseph and Mary, and they're headed to Bethlehem to be counted in the census. They traveled from Nazareth to obey the law. I can't even tell you all the things that they saw. Bethlehem was busy, everyone in a tizzy. Finding a room wasn't going to be easy. 
When they got to the inn, there was no place to stay. But the innkeeper said, use my stable today. It wasn't very nice, and it surely wasn't warm. Yet this is the place where the Savior was born. And in Luke 2, we see Jesus the Savior is born, and that there's shepherds in the area, and they're watching their sheep. I mean, basically, they're at work, okay? They're, they're at their job, they're at their workplace, and an angel appears to them. I mean, can you picture that? Like, picture yourself sitting in your workplace or out in your, your job, and an angel appears to you. And if that's not freaky enough, the angel says to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angel pronounces to these shepherds and ultimately through Scripture to the world that Jesus is Savior. Every good story has one. Have you ever noticed that? You know, every good story has some kind of hero, some kind of, of savior, someone whose purpose is to rescue those in need. It could be a superhero. It could be a leader. It could be some zero who just really needs her. It could be a country boy saving her from the city. It usually involves a damsel that's pretty. Every story I tell you, or every story you see has a hero. That's so. Every story worth reading, that's all that I know. Every good story has a hero, a savior. And so God writes Jesus into our story because the reality is that we need saving, that, that we're flawed and, and we're broken. And, and I could go to scripture and, and point out in Romans how it says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, but the, I really don't believe that we need to look at scripture to recognize the brokenness of humanity. I believe that if we just were to look around, we can see that we as humans have fallen short of God's original design, that, that we are not functioning the way that we were created to, that we've fallen short. And, and it's so easy to look around and, and see the need for a savior. The world is black and dark. What's harder, though, sometimes, is to look in the mirror and see my need for a Savior. Some of us have no trouble with this. You know, we look at our lives, we look at the things that we do and the things that we think about, and we just recognize, I need saving. But for some of us, this is harder because we have this, this relative approach to how good we are. And so we'll look at the person down the road and say, well, that guy needs a Savior, I don't need a savior. But if we look closely, I mean, if we're truly honest with ourselves, if we look deeper, we can see it. We can see the blackness of our own hearts, the, the selfishness that's, that's always there, that's always present, nagging at us to gratify itself. And if we're really honest, well, we may seem better than that guy. The reality is, I'm broken. I do need a savior. Welcome to Faith Mountain, where we love people to life with the life-giving message of the good news. Merry Christmas, are you feeling it? You know, the reality is that this is good news. But it's only good news if we recognize our need for it. The gospel is only life-giving if we recognize that we need someone to give us life. A savior is only a savior when we realize that we need to be saved. When we recognize, I need a savior. When we see the, the blackness of our hearts and we say, I need to be saved. The Bible is very clear about what we must do. And we see it in Romans chapter 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this is how you receive this salvation. If you believe, you can finally receive. 
If you confess, you will find yourself blessed. God raises those who are dead in the grave when they profess to him their need to be saved. Jesus is Savior. But that's not all that Jesus is. He, he definitely is a Savior. But he's so much more. And while there are many, many things that we could say about Jesus, I, I want to focus on one other thing that we see in Luke 2. And it's in verse 11 where it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is ruler. Jesus is master. This isn't just true for a priest or a pastor. Jesus is boss. Jesus is king. Even if you can't perform or can't sing, the reality is that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is the authority. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, the authority. The authority has been born. Jesus as Savior is a welcome sight, but Jesus as Lord might just bring you fright. We all like saving when we are in need, but not really someone to account for our deeds. Jesus is the authority. And this trait's a little less exciting in our society. You know, this is the part of Jesus that we're a little less eager to receive. We live in the United States of America. We stand on the Declaration of Independence. In fact, independence is a hallmark of our nation. And for a vast majority of people, the, the pinnacle of achievement is to become their own authority. The, the, the height of accomplishment and it is to, to be self-employed, to be the boss, to be the authority. And it's the goal for so many in our culture. So this idea of Jesus as Lord is not the most appealing thing, at least not at first glance. And the reality is that the lordship of Jesus is vital to the good news. It's essential to Jesus and why we need him. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say you go to the doctor for some testing. You know, maybe they've found some abnormalities and there's the potential that it's very serious, perhaps even life-threatening. How much relief does it bring you when some random person walks up to you and says, I just want you to know you're going to be okay. I can feel it. Or maybe they even say, God told me. That might bring a sense of relief. That might give you a little bit of peace. But have you released all your anxiety about these tests? Have you let it all go? Are you just feeling happy and, and, and great? Well, no. But what happens when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, your test results came back negative? You are healthy. That changes everything, right? Now you have that peace. Now you're relieved of that anxiety. Why? Because the doctor has authority in the medical field. Or you could say it this, other, this way. Um, let's say you've just taken a final exam, and you're not feeling all that great about how the test went. And your mom comes up to you and says, oh, sweetie, I'm sure you did just fine. Do, do you feel better? Do you, all of a sudden all the weight and stress of how you did on this test is, is released? It's gone. No, of course not. Moms are genetically engineered to make stuff like that up so you feel better. It's what they do. Your mom has no clue how you did on that test. But what happens when you get that paper back or, or when you go online and you see an A? All that stress, all the anxiety is gone. Why? Because the teacher has authority. So authority is critical to the matter at hand. 
Because we cannot be saved by someone without any authority. We cannot be absolved of our wrongdoing by someone who has no authority to do so. It's really no different than mommy patting you on the behind and saying, you're special and it's going to be okay. Jesus has authority. And we see it all throughout the scriptures. You know, in, in Luke chapter 2, the angels say that, right? In, in Matthew chapter 9, he heals a man who was paralyzed and forgives his sin, demonstrating his authority. In, in Mark 1.22, the, the people recognize that Jesus taught like no one else, that he had authority. And in Matthew 28, he declares that all authority has been given to him. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the authority. And this is so important because Jesus has the power to save. And without authority, Jesus cannot be Savior. Without his lordship, Jesus cannot save. And this is the hope of Christmas, that, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is also Christ the Lord. He is Savior, and he has the power and the authority to save. You know, I believe that we as humans have a natural tendency to favor one or the other. You know, either we like the idea of Jesus as Savior, or we like to see Jesus as Lord. And if you're not a Christ follower, you, you probably have even just seen this in different Christians. You, you have those who see Jesus as Savior, and he just, he's so great. He takes all your pain away. He makes your life better. He's almost like a cosmic genie with unlimited wishes and kind of like Santa Claus. Or then you see those that favor Jesus as Lord, and they're all about the authority. They're all about the rules of religion. Jesus is all about keeping us in our place and eradicating the world of sin. But I wonder, how many Christians have you seen and how many of us as Christ followers really understand both? See, the reality is that Jesus does make your life better, but not in some cosmic genie kind of way. You get to experience all the fullness and blessing that this life has to offer in the midst of the brokenness, in the middle of all the pain and hardship that this world has. Jesus doesn't remove those things from our lives. He just walks with us as we experience them. And in addition, Jesus is all about authority. He is absolutely king and ruler. He just does this under a completely different set of rules. He has this incredibly high standard for our behavior, but he has an equally high standard of love, forgiveness, and grace. And when we have a Jesus who's both Savior and Lord, we get to experience this full life as we're submitted to the only one capable of truly saving us. That is the hope of Christmas. That is who Jesus is. He's both Savior and Lord. And if you're here today and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus as Savior, maybe you've never made Jesus your Lord. I wonder, is today the day that you were meant to do just that? Is this the moment that you were intended to allow Jesus to be both Savior and Lord? And in a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to do just that. But for those of us that are Christ followers, would you just take a moment 
Would you reflect? Would you consider? Is Jesus my Savior? Is Jesus my Lord? Or is Jesus both Savior and Lord? And what do I need to do to give him his rightful place? What do I need to do to adjust any imbalance that might exist in my life? Would you pray with me? Jesus, you are the hope of Christmas. That, that you came to save us who we're in such need of saving. Our, our brokenness, our, the, the blackness of our hearts, it's, it's real. It, it's tangible. It's obvious. But you loved us enough to come, to be Emmanuel, to be God with us. And we are so grateful. And so if you've never made a decision for, for Jesus, this is your opportunity to do so. Just, just pray with me now. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this world to be my Savior, to be my Lord. I receive your free gift of salvation and I submit to you as Lord. Thank you for saving me. And for the rest of us, God, I, I pray that, that we would see you as both Savior and Lord. That, that you would save us and free us from, from our own selfishness and self-centeredness as we submit our lives to you as an act of worship. We want to see you as both Savior and Lord. We love you. Amen.